and welcome to Talking Cars. I'm Jennifer Stockberger. I'm Ryan Pizlikowski. I'm Michael Crossan. And we didn't run out of cars, but we certainly have lots of audience questions. So we're going to dedicate the podcast this week to all of the questions you've been asking, variety of topics. So I'm glad you two are here. As always, if you have questions, send them to talkingcars at iCloud.com text, video, whatever suits you. These happen to be all written questions this week. And we will start with Larry from Allen, Texas, who asks, recently a colleague said she had decided against buying a new EV electric vehicle because the batteries have to be replaced every five years at a cost of over $10,000. Is that true? We are going to go to you, Mike Crossan, because you have a very recent extra education in EV and batteries and all of it. So we're going to let you talk to Larry. Yeah. Um, my whole world has sort of turned into EV recently. Um, yeah, <laughs> Jake Larry, calls EVs the disruptor a of, little bit. of the whole market. Anyway, yeah. I had to, had to learn some new things, but they're, um, they're very interesting. And Larry, you know, that's a really good question. And I think it's a question that a lot of people would want to know. Um, it's sort of be like, you know, I'm going to buy this gasoline car. Do I have to replace the engine? Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a possibly, you know, big and expensive prospect, but you don't know, they don't have to be replaced. But sure, there could be a problem with the battery and it might need to be replaced. You know, there's no guarantees. Right. Um, you know, we're not seeing it though. I mean, it does happen. You know, there are EVs out there that have had to have that done, but we're not seeing it all that common. You know, we don't have a bunch of cars in our fleet that need to have batteries right. replaced and things like that. Um, and yeah, it, there, there could be some costs associated with it. The good news is there are warranties on these cars, like all systems in the cars. Um, but eight year, 100,000 mile is the federal requirement. So that's the .gov mm-hmm. requirement to sell a, a electric vehicle. Um, that's what you have to cover the battery. California's doing a little better, 10 years, 100,000 miles. Right. And I wouldn't be surprised if maybe some states in the future mm-hmm. sort of up that as well um, to meet the California standard. If you're out of that warranty period, yeah, you're going to be responsible, you know, if you do want to fix the vehicle and it could be a pricey proposition. Yeah. Um, depends on the car, depends on the size of the battery and where you are. You know, labor rates vary and things like that. Do you go new? Do you go used? Do you go refurbished? And yeah, I could definitely see it costing $10,000 or more. I would almost hate to think what like a, a Mercedes EQE or a BMW Oof. i something battery would cost. Right. Um, could be quite a bit more. You know, at that point, yeah, you might be looking at a new vehicle versus right. replacing that battery. So it is a concern, but... Um, not every five years. Not right? every that's, five that's little, years. That's, yeah. right. Absolutely. And what if you we, were in that five-year range, right. it's going to be covered unless you've done 80,000 or 100,000 miles in California You know, within that time. So. Right. What we, I wonder what they're seeing for length on these batteries. I mean, they, they've been around a while, but not like 20, 30 years, you know, maybe t- what? I mean, Eight Tesla's, you know, 10, 10 years, years yeah. um, probably at least, but... Mm. It really depends on how you use the car, how you treat the car, sure. how you charge it. Um, we had an article sort of recently that talks about about 2% degradation in range, right. or, you know, battery over time, capacity yeah. over yeah. time, um, or should say about 2% every year. So you can maybe extrapolate that out. If you do a lot of DC fast charging, mm-hmm. it's going to be more. If you drive right. a lot and do a lot of charging, it's going to be more. Yeah, if you charge yeah. to 100%, it's going to be a little bit more. But um yeah, I mean, time will still tell. They're still pretty new. I mean, yeah. our parking lot is starting to fill up with them. Yeah, so. we'll know in about uh, 10 years from now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, for yeah. sure. But, you know, it's listening to you, it, it's very parallel to an internal combustion engine. Over time, you may be facing large repairs. I think of transmissions and things like that, that mm-hmm. you have to weigh, is it worth keeping the car or is it worth doing it? And I certainly think, you know, listening to our reliability, it is not the norm for full battery replacement. It can happen to you. It your absolutely point. can happen. And I know some manufacturers are actually repairing them. Yeah. You know, if there's a bad cell or a bad group of cells, they can go in and replace that. So you don't need the whole pack necessarily. Um, but again, it, it's still pretty new. Yep. And, you know, cars have been around for well over 100 years. These EVs, about 10. But yep. really, it's the last couple of years they become very prevalent. So um, it is a concern. I would just say, you know, know what the warranty on it right. is. Um, you know, if you're buying a new one, there's a little less concern there. If you're buying something pre owned, you know, know what that mileage is, right. know what the original in-service date of that car was. You know, so if, if Ryan was the first buyer, I need to know what date you right. bought that because that's that eight-year mark or 10-year mark, you know, to the yeah. day that, that I would be working off of if I was the second or the third owner. Right. Of the You'd vehicle. want it if I had it. <laughs> He's a DC fast charger. <laughs> but also to your colleague, Larry, you know, um, there are other reasons to consider or not consider an EV, but I think it's more about the suitability to your lifestyle, Absolutely. access to charging, et cetera, not necessarily will the right. battery fail in five years. So anyway, thank you, Mike. You know far more than I do for sure. Our second question comes from Jean 
Why is it that other countries can get the same trim and models of cars we have in the U.S., yet they get better warranties or more features in the same trim level? The new Honda Accord in Canada gets blind spot monitoring on every trim level. But when I was shopping for the same car here, I noticed you have to go up to a higher trim for it. Shouldn't such a feature be included on the same trim, regardless of the country it's being purchased in? So I'm going to take this one for Jean. And the answer, the short answer is if it's a safety benefit, yes, but that is not the way it works. So typically it's either requirements, you know, federal standards that require things or um, some consumer information program, not unlike our own or the Insurance Institute or the NCAP programs. There's a European one. There's a U.S. NCAP that drive these things ahead of federal mandates that say they have to be in. We just did, Emily and I have been working on this rear seat safety thing, and there was great examples. Emily has created a slide that shows probably 20 vehicles, those that have better features in Europe, those that have equal features to the same model in the U.S., and those that have better features in the U.S. Well, let me just tell you on that slide she created, there are no vehicles that have better features in the U.S. Many have more features, safety-related, in Europe that are not here. And the great example is in the Euro NCAP program, for example, they put a dummy in the rear seat of that vehicle. So that crash test, if they add some of the seat belt features and that we've been talking about in this rear seat safety, they do better in that crash test. So if they don't, they won't. So there's an internal incentive in Europe for them to put like things like pretensioners and force uh, limiters in those cars to do better. We don't have those rear seated dummies yet in our NCAP program. The Insurance Institute just put that rear seat dummy in their moderate overlap crash test. So we expect to see some of those features. It's almost, and I don't want it sound too disparaging to the manufacturers. They won't do it unless they have to mm. with some of these features. But to answer Gene's question, yes, they should be. And that's certainly part of what we at Consumer Reports are advocating all the, all the time. You know, mm. we should see automatic emergency braking with pedestrian detection, not just on every car, but on every trim of that car. So Gene, you are literally preaching to the choir. I don't know if you guys had anything to add, but we, we even see it in this country in different regions that cars will be equipped differently. Right. Yeah. I was thinking about the regions. Um, you know, certainly safety stuff should yeah. just be in all the cars. Um, but as a technician, we used to see a car, you know, wherever you are, a car that's a California car, it has some different emission systems right. or maybe a car that did come from Canada, you know, whether someone's on vacation or they yep. moved here and parts are a little more difficult to get. You have to deal with the country codes because it's a colder climate. Yep. So the car has some different systems and things like that. So, you know, but safety stuff, I think absolutely should be, you know, you should have the best available no matter where you are. Yep. Um, but certainly some of those other kind of funny options, you don't necessarily need the best AC system if you live somewhere really cold, you know, so they, they have some options and things like that. But yeah, I think it's an excellent question. All wheel drive in New England. We exactly. see a lot of that yeah. that you can't get elsewhere. Or, you know, every once in a while we need to get a front wheel drive version. We can't find it. Right. So great question, Gene, and definitely real. I think of the simple top tether that's on child seats required in Canada that they they use it, not required in the U.S. Simple safety things. That slightly, slightly off topic, but go. I feel like Europe and other countries used to always get the more fun versions of sports cars too. Like there would always be like the M3, but they had like the extra horsepower. Right. A lot of that was due to like our emissions and stuff. It's regional, you know. Absolutely. But, yeah. and better bumpers. Uh, too. Yeah. I, or at I least feel, more uh, aesthetically pleasing bumpers. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. But they also have roads they can use them on. It's different. It's just yeah. different. Exactly. Different. Different driving, different, yeah. different requirements. So great question, Gene. Third question comes from Bill. I've read that as tread wears on tires, Ryan, the wet stopping distances increase more slowly on higher quality versus lower quality tires. When shopping for tires, how can I know whether they will retain good wet stopping distances over the tire's life? So definitely for you. Sure. Uh, and Bill's read correctly here. Um, this, it's real. Yep. It's a real thing. Um, some years ago, we actually did some testing ourselves um, on some just regular performance all season tires on a Toyota Camry. We shaved them down, actually. We actually shaved down the tread to get them to 430 seconds, which is getting pretty worn. And um, we did some wet testing. And, and these were tires that had this technology. Well, some, some yes, oh, some no. Some were, okay, we were, sorry. It was, we were investigating because, okay. you know, some of the manufacturers are, you know, arguing. You're, you're, we test brand new tires, right? 
Um, right. And they're going to perform differently when they're brand new as opposed to when they're, you know, worn um, or even, half, you know, half worn. Right. So we did, we wanted to find out ourselves. Now, wearing out a tire completely or, or halfway it takes a long time, and a lot of effort. So yeah. we shaved them. We are missing out on some of the aging effects, but mm -hmm. we did get, we did remove, um, you know, tread. And um, as you do that, you, you lose some of those um, grooves or sipes. The little slits in the tire. Right. Those are the things, those little sipes and stuff, those give you the uh, wet traction. They, they help give you wet traction, snow traction, ice uh, breaking. It's a mechanical um, grip advantage right. for the tire. An edge. Yeah. So as a tire wears, you lose those. Now, when you, they make a tire, it goes in a mold and they have to pull this thing out of a mold eventually. So, um, you can't do you can't do too, too too much crazy stuff, but luckily um, Michelin has they discovered a way to make um, this. They had this Evergrip technology. Um, they put it out some years ago, and we that's where kind of where we started mm -hmm. investigating this situation. And they actually were able to build these sipes and grooves that actually open up even more as the tire wears. Yeah. So um, that's remarkable because a that's hard to get it out of the mold i'm trying to wonder how uh, they would get they, it out of they the mold. It they would not tell, or yeah, something they I don't would know. not tell us but no. they said it was a trick to do but oh, they yeah. they figured out how, a way to do that along yep. with compounding compounding's huge um so they figured out a way to do that and we tested it and it works uh -huh. um, they they retain they're still losing their grip but they retained it a lot better than tires uh -huh. that didn't so um yeah, Michelin's a premium brand. You're going to pay more money right. for that, that that type of technology. I don't know of too many other companies uh, marketing that actual technology. They might be doing it anyway. But yeah. um, to answer his question, though, it's hard to know. Right. Um, because as they wear, um, you know, we, we don't test them half worn or you, completely worn or anything like that. But um, it is true that they do lose their wet uh, grip. Um, and, the, you know, the best thing you can do is just kind of pay attention to that while you're driving. And yeah. Um, you can buy a Michelin, Michelin. This isn't a Michelin commercial, but um, they they do have that technology, and it does does work from what we've seen. So, and to your point, you know the compounding. So much is in the yeah. compounding that you will never know. As some people say to us all the time, they're round, they're black. You're never going to know right. what's in that compound to Absolutely. help improve you know even aging effects mm -hmm. you know does it stay yeah there's that, that aspect time? too and we didn't we didn't just we didn't we weren't able to capture that just because it would take forever but uh, tires will dry out too the rubber dries out eventually that affects it as well so. yeah i think too for anybody regardless of where you live you, you're going to get rain at some point mm -hmm. to me that's the best indicator yeah. of when your tires are wearing and you should be thinking about ah because i've now hydroplaned in this one spot that i don't think i've hydroplaned before sure to me it's the best early indicator of when you need tire replacement right but yeah good another good question all right next one comes from john several manufacturers now provide 48 volt mild hybrid versions of their cars what's the warranty coverage like for these batteries full hybrids like the toyota venza have very high voltage batteries that are required by law to cover as they are seen as part of their emissions control but when i asked a manufacturer about the 48 volt ones i was told they are only covered by the general car warranty can you explain why they might draw this distinction seems to me they basically serve the same purpose again i am looking at you mike sure so this we're always used to having a 12 volt battery in a car and while cars still have that we're getting away from that mm -hmm. um 14 to 16 volts is becoming a little bit more normal uh -huh. in just a lot of vehicles but a lot of cars um gasoline cars have this 48 volt system and the real reason is you can do more work with 48 volts than you can with 12. so right. we can run bigger electrical accessories with just sort of less strain on a system by increasing the voltage. And um, basically like AC compressor is a big one and starter motors, yeah. um, especially for stop start technology and things because like that. Because of their draw. Yeah the, yeah, the current draw and yep. we basically just get a bigger push. We can have smaller wires, less weight, less cost, all those things. Yep. Um, now, as far as this being an emission system, you'd wonder, how is this just basically what looks like a, just sort of a bigger car battery? How is that an emission system? But because we can run the AC compressor and we can turn the car off at stoplights and things like that, we are saving fuel. So technically, mm -hmm. you know, I would accept the argument that this is an emission system. Mm -hmm. And I think the federal government has accepted that argument as well. Um, I did some research on this and, yeah, I'm not sure um, – what manufacturer John spoke to, you know, when he got the information that's just the regular warranty. But everything I found, um, this basically falls under that federal emissions warranty or yeah. state emissions warranty. And um, eight year, 80,000 mile is the number that I kept coming back to. I suppose there's maybe an exception to that. But um, you know, the few manufacturers I just sort of called out just that I knew that had 48 volt systems in them, everything looked like eight year, 80,000. Ah. And, um, you know, so you're saving fuel. It is an emissions concern, so they, they lump they it in with that emissions warranty. Uh, I would just say maybe the person you know that um, John spoke to was just unaware of it, 
you know, just sort of made a, a guess rather than knowing the answer. Or um, I used to work in a service department. It's right. kind of rough to, you're supposed to be the expert. And sometimes you get a question, you just don't know. Right. So it's right. like, I would always say, you know, that's a great question. I don't know. Let me get your yeah. number and email and I'll look it up and get back to you. I know. I'd rather provide the, provide the real information yeah. than just what I think off the top of my head, you know, as long as I can help it. Um, but, you know, that is a, sometimes a difficult position, you know, you're right. trying to sell someone some work and they have a question. You're like, I don't really know. Right. Yeah. Um, and the expectation that you're the expert, exactly. you know, every ins and outs of every vehicle on your yeah. lifts, but um, yeah. But this 48 volt thing is, is a lot more common yep. in just regular mm -hmm. internal combustion engine cars. Um, you know, we have several like out in the garage right now that have it and um, it's something yep. that technicians are going to deal with and people as well. You know, yep. if you have to replace that battery, it is going to be more than a regular 12 volt battery and they're getting up in price too, several hundred dollars um, in some cases. And again, I just did a couple of quick searches. It mm -hmm. could be maybe $2,000 well, in the neighborhood mm -hmm. of that for one of these 48 volt batteries, if in fact it does need to be replaced. But I'm um, again, you know, eight year, 80,000 mile. Right. So that's sort of a concern down the road and, um, you know, might you have to deal with that at some point? Yeah, absolutely. So, sure. you know, it could, could be keep a concern. cars a long time, back to the original question from Larry. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Yep. It just depends on how you use the car and sort of, um, you know, what your tolerance for it is. You are going to save some money on fuel and things like that. So if you think about, I drove this car for 10 years, I probably saved a bunch of money on gas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got to put another battery in this car that's right. expensive. But in the end, you know, you might have a you might still be positive right. you know, in that transaction. Right. Are they bigger? I haven't, I haven't noticed or looked. Is the battery a lot bigger? So it is a little bit bigger in size. Yeah. Um, some of them, they're putting them under rear seats or under the floor oh, or in trunks. Yeah, you know, they're they not to, meant to be serviceable or like your 12 volt. Yeah, because right? they don't yeah. want to, you know, right. they wouldn't want you trying to jump start to it or something yeah, yeah, like that. Yeah. So it um, no, just it kind of looks like a regular battery, but for packaging's sake, sometimes it's right. you know, maybe not so it's rectangular or things like that. So Fair it enough. sounds like, John, John, you may want to do some double checking Either, Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Of of that, and you know, I would talk yeah. to the service department. You know, if you right. talk to the sales department, they might be unaware, um, yep. or even a parts department might be unaware. Yep. Just get a service advisor on the phone, or better yet, stop by and um, just say, "Hey, I have a concern. This is the car I have. Yep. You know, what can you tell me?" Great, hmm. great, perfect. Um, question from Steve: My 2016 Subaru Outback gets 29 miles per gallon in the warmest summer months and drops to 22 miles per gallon in the dead of winter, about a 32% difference. Isn't that about the same drop in range we're seeing with EVs in the cold? I'm curious to get your take on this and why no one ever talks about it. Ryan. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it's a real thing. Uh, a real um, thing. You know, EVs, it's been very clear to us that you lose a lot of range yep. um, when it gets cold. Um, the, the cold is a battery's worst enemy, really. Um, and, the, and the heat, too, for that matter. But the cold is going to take your range away. Right. Um, but in a, a, a you know, gasoline internal combustion engine car, um, you know, you, you might not think of it, but you are because it, it doesn't seem as severe because your range doesn't just plummet. Um, you are going to you, you use more fuel in the winter than you will in the summer. Now, um, his figures are a bit um, aggressive, I think. Um, I'm not saying that he's wrong, but um, we did some quick calculations um, with John, Big John and I, on um, in our database. And we actually put in some numbers. So when we do our fuel testing, we, we keep it between 32, above freezing, 32 degrees, right. up to, I think, uh, under 90 or 80. Um, we did it from 32 to 80. And we put in two different numbers, um, just fake numbers. In to the see. calculation. In the calculation. Right. Because what happens is on our highway test, we actually, um, we have a correction factor to adjust for what he's, you know, what yep. um, uh, Steve's talking about. So, we don't, we saw from 32 degrees up to 80, we saw only really like a 9% difference. Um, and our correction factor corrects for that to keep it, um, you know, a level playing field. Yeah. Now, when we do our field testing, we don't run the, um, air conditioning. Uh, we don't run anything and we have the windows closed. Um, we're giving it the best case scenario for the car really. Right. So, um, but that being said, um, in the regular, you know, person driving out in the roads in the winter, you have your heat on, you're not really pulling energy out of the engine cause you're just using residual heat from the engine. Right. Right. And the blower, the fan just blows it at you. Um, in the summer you had the air conditioning on, that's a separate system that's actually taxing the engine, which is using more fuel. Um, so you're, you know, you, you're, that adds it, adds to it too, in a way. Um, in the, in the reverse way though, right? Yeah. Because now it's summer and you're, you know, so, um, but in the winter you have, you know, especially an all wheel drive car, you have, when you first take off, the car is cold. Um, you're gonna, you're gonna run a longer warm up um, or high idle um, mode to get the car yeah. up to temperature. The, the differentials, this sounds silly, yes. the differentials have, have oil in them, they're stiffer. Uh, it takes a little longer for that to warm up. Um, all these little things, tire pressures drop a little bit. You're, you're taxing the car a little more. You're going to use more right. fuel. So um, it's absolutely true what he's seeing. What he's see, um, it's a bit, um, it seems a bit aggressive, but maybe there's other, there's a million variables and his might be differently different, but um, 
I mean, I don't know if you have something to add to that, Mike, but I think... No, um, I mean, it is a very real situation. Mm -hmm. And one of the things is, um, if we just talk about the winter fuel, they put some additives in it oh, to help it atomize. That's yep. true too. Yep. And because um, when it's cold, the fuel doesn't want to basically spray as well. And if you think about like a can of maybe hairspray, you want that nice fine mist. That's how the fuel yep. burns efficiently. Mm -hmm. But as the hairspray maybe gets clogged and starts to kind of spit and stuff, the fuel doesn't want to burn because liquid fuel doesn't burn. So we need this fuel to atomize and outgas and you know, for good combustion. Combust, right. but, you know, my first thought was, and I do this too, in the summer, I fire up a car, I throw in gear and I go, but in the winter, I fire up the car and then I'm like looking for the heat to seat and trying to set the seat. <laughs> right. I might be in the driveway for just a couple of minutes and that does add up too. And that could contribute right. exactly. to this 32% difference. Plus, like you mentioned, all the transmission fluid, gear fluid, um, Stiffer, yeah. tire pressures drops, you know, the tires, um, are the compound of the tire can change with temperature and the sure. rolling resistance I think could change. You exactly. know, mm -hmm. Summer yeah. tires get really noisy and they mm -hmm. tend to get hard and you lose traction. Yep. Right. So there's a lot of variables. Um, and again, I agree maybe 32% is a little aggressive, but mm -hmm. um, I don't know where Steve lives, so I don't really know how yeah, cold he, it he is where be, Steve the lives. Extreme temperature, the temperature can be much more extreme than what I, you know, we looked right. at 32 we cut to it at 32, but right. that doesn't mean it's not Correct. colder exactly. where Steve right. is, right? And exactly. I, and I think it's true. Worth, yeah. yeah, it's worth mentioning too, um, at least in my experience, the whole country seems to get winter fuel. It comes in October, yeah. November. You know, they don't and, want to differentiate. Correct. And you can still get that. You live in South Florida. You're still probably getting winter fuel. So you're like, it's not really that cold here. Yeah. You know, it's in the 60s, but your fuel economy <laughs> might drop off because right. of that. Um, so just, you know, it's it's unfortunate. Um, we do that for fuel emissions. We're using more fuel, but it helps the emissions of what's actually coming out of the tailpipe. Right. You know, so there is, is a reason for that. I was noting too, Department of Energy, you know, when we were doing the investigation, colder air is denser, increasing aerodynamic drag on a vehicle, especially at highway speeds. Hmm. I never thought of just the drag. Yeah, absolutely. But that's part of it as well, again, as well as all we, the other we things. We put the windows said. up when we do right. fuel economy testing because it's like dragging a parachute behind right. you. Yeah. And um, I do a lot of the driving for fuel economy testing. Yeah. So when it is, you know, that 33, 34 degrees, you're cold in the car, you try to bundle up. <laughs> and when it's, you know, 80 degrees and sunny, um, you're sweating. You sweat, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd rather be cold than the sweating. I, I've done the fuels many times. And yeah. When it's hot, it's not fun, especially if it's human. <laughs> Yeah, but again, we take all those variables right. out yeah. and give it to your point, benefit Ryan, the, the benefit of the doubt, and yeah. we still see, you know, the differences. So the last question comes from Mike. Mike says, I picked up my 2023 Honda CRV recently. Congratulations, Mike, and have one nagging problem I cannot figure out. How do I delete a radio station from my favorites list? I was able to figure out how to save it, but I want to delete several I added by mistake. Can you help me? So thankfully, <laughs> we have a new 2023 Honda CRV hybrid in our garage. And I actually went out and gave this a try, Mike. And I agree with you. I don't think there's a way to just delete a preset or a favorite, but you can change it. So certainly when once you have a preset that maybe you don't want or added by mistake, in Mike's case, if you just hold it, well, get to the station you want and then hold the preset, it will displace that preset with the one you actually want, as long as that's the one playing. Um, and you can, yeah, and it'll just displace it. And you can have, if you truly don't want, you know, I think there's 10 or more on that and you can scroll across. If you don't want them, you can actually duplicate them. You can have the same channel twice if maybe you only wanted five on each of the scrolls. But I, I agree with Mike, there isn't a way to just delete, not that I could find, only displace. So hopefully you find that helpful. So that is it for this episode. Great questions, um, different topics. As always, keep them coming at talkingcars at iCloud.com. We'll get back to our regular car coverage next week. Um, this video was um, filmed and produced by David Abrams, Andrew Belise, and Anatoly Shumsky. Thank you always for listening, for watching, and we'll see you next week.